Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is Woman Without Limits. I am Reverend Kathy Kuna, and it's such a delight to have you right here. Let me tell you, we bring you amazing stories, amazing, that change your life, alter your destinies, and there's no way you can watch Woman Without Limits and remain the same again. I want to let you know you're that woman without limits. Nobody can stop you, only you can stop yourself. So get out of your way and begin to sow like the eagle you are. It is a delight to bring you today's episode. Oh my gosh. I want you to buckle your safety belts. We're about to take off. I have with me an amazing woman. Remember, we bring you beautiful people from all over the world. So I have an amazing woman of God. She's a young lady and yet a mighty prophetess that God is using in this end time in such a profound manner. She has an amazing story that I want you to hear because it's going to change your life and it's going to help you to realize anybody can be lifted. Welcome with me all the way from Connecticut, United States of America, Prophetess Leslie Osei. Hello, Reverend. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm so excited. Thank you for inviting me on the show. Thank you so much. We just finished an amazing conference. Oh, my goodness. I, I told you, you have made an imprint in Kenya. You have cemented an imprint of heaven in Kenya. And we thank God for you. Amen. Yes. I don't think it's going to be the same again. No, no. And I love what you taught about prophecy and what yes. it is. Yes. And maybe in the end, we're going to touch on that a little. Okay, sure. Just for people to open, you know, to, their minds to be open yes. to know. Because there's a lot of confusion in that area. Yeah. You know, yeah. where people are running to people, prophesy to me. <laughs> Tell me something, you know. Yeah. And as a result, they're getting a lot of confusion. Yeah. Even in their own personal yeah. lives. The word know? of God says lack of knowledge we perish. It didn't say anything else but because of lack of knowledge. Right. So this is the time we should have more knowledge about everything. Right. Yeah. So tell me, prophetess, um, where are you coming from? Well, my parents are from Ghana, West Africa. Wee. Yeah. But I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I won't tell you my age, but yeah. I will let you know. But I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I am one of seven children. Yes, but um, I always like to start my story off with my mother. Right. My mother and my father got married by the grace of God, and my mom struggled a bit to have children. And so, about two years into the marriage, and you know, African culture, as soon as you get married, <laughs> you have you to have better. a baby. You <laughs> better. Like, you know where yeah. I come from? I come from a. Uh, a tribe called the Kikuyu mm -hmm. in Kenya, uh -huh. and mostly you get pregnant before. Oh wow! Like oh, they wow. want, to, yeah. That's it's a culture. Yeah. Like they want to know, can you really can do you? it? <laughs> so it's a big thing for us yeah. in Africa. Yeah. And so to imagine, especially back in the day, nowadays they've actually calmed down a bit. But back in the day, it was a big thing. And my father married my mom. And for two years, there was nothing coming. And one day, she overheard my father's grandmother call him into the room and say, why did you bring this barren woman into this house? And she said that it just moved her in a way that she herself was like, wow. And so she started praying. And I believe that was the beginning of her really getting into the things of God. Mm. And she Was said, she born again at that time or she got born again in the process? She was born again, but you know there's like two levels of born again. Yeah. You're born again <laughs> and then you're born born again. Yeah. So I believe that, that began her born born again. That, that was a, that she had a first level. Yeah. She went into the second she went into the second level. Right. Because she's always loved the Lord. And then I believe that hearing that took her to another level with mm. God. Mm. And so she began to pray and fast and, you know, do whatever she had to do in terms of seeking a child from Christ. Right. Especially in, you know, the Ghanaian culture, even in African culture, people are quick to go to all sorts of different entities to go look for children. Right. But she said she would never do that, and she never did that by the grace of God. That's true. Because good. at the end of the day, God is the one who gives out kids. Absolutely. Not the devil. Absolutely. And so she sought after God, prayed, fasted, and then finally she got pregnant, and it was a girl. And I guess back in the day, they didn't really have sonograms and all that stuff. 
So she ended up having a stillborn. Can you imagine? Carried it for nine months, and after that was still stillborn. And so when she pushed the baby out, she was just like devastated, like, devastated. Because she went back to school. Yeah, a, yeah. Like Which is a. even worse. Yeah. Which yeah. is for all that, just right. let me not have a kid. And so I could just imagine her devastation. But she began to pray, and again, that drew her closer to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then she ended up having my brother. And when she had him, he was getting sick here and there. And she's like, this is not what I'm called for. I did not wait all this time. Now to have a baby, now he's getting sick. I can imagine the fear. The fear. Yeah. yeah. The, the, oh, no, it's, it's, it's concerning. Yeah. Especially that you've lost one, mm -hmm. then this one is sickly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she started praying, and by the grace of God, I think my, my brother has not been in a hospital ever since. He's like full of energy. He refuses to even go to the doctor sometimes. Yeah. And then came a third child. The, th the third child was a boy. And so she, um, he was about six months old and she had a store. The, where she lived, there was, she had her own store. So she went to go open the store. And she, the way she tells me the story, she said, he never cries, he was fine, everything was okay. And then one day, he just started crying a lot. And she's like, oh, why is my son crying so much? Mm -hmm. So she figured, let me go and open my store for the um, people my to sell. Yeah. Right. My, my employees. Yeah. And she went, opened it, and she said when she was there, she just felt something. So she came back upstairs, because it was right down the stairs from her house. So when she came back upstairs, her mother basically had the baby dead on her lap. Yes. Like in a few minutes? Yes, within a few minutes. Come to find out, apparently he had a growth in his neck that, of course, you know, they didn't find out, they didn't know, and I guess it was suppressing something. Right. Who knows, but six Maybe it shuts the airway yeah, or shut, something? Yeah, I believe that's what it would be. Right. So, can you imagine now? You have to go and bury another child. And that, that he was how old? Six months. Six months Six only. Six months only. So she always shows us this one picture of him. And he was so handsome, just cute little boy. Wow. And he departed just like that. So at this time, I believe that she was just angry. She was upset. Yeah. And she was like, no. But one thing I love about my mother is she's very persevering. And she taught me you know, how to persevere and press in, in prayer. Right. So she began to pray. And instead of taking it the route of, I'll be depressed, I hate the Lord, you know. I'm people, done. I'm, I'm done, done with the this Lord. Christianity. You took one, mm -hmm. I left you, I mm -hmm. forgave you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we even forgive God. You took one, I forgave you. Yeah. <laughs> the second one became sickly, I still stuck with you. Mm -hmm. Now you've taken another yeah. one. Yeah. Like I'm done. Yeah. 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 But, but she, she didn't stood. go that right. Right. She stood. And so she began to pray and you know, doing what she has to do, mountains, fasting, sewing, service, honoring, whatever she has to do. Like the way she tells me the story, she's like, Mommy, I did everything that I have to do. Mm. And she went into covenant with the Lord. Concerning my brother that's still alive. And then with me, she mm. also went into covenant. And she said, Lord, my life is not supposed to be a mockery, and you cannot be mocked. And she said, upon some prayers, she became like Hannah, like crazy prayers, praying, praying, praying. Right. And then finally, I came. Hello. 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 <laughs> Yours truly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here I popped up. Um. And, you know, it just shows the power of covenant. So you came after the one who passed away. I came after the one who passed away. So I can only imagine that though her faith was strong, she probably still was like, hopefully nothing bad happens. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Even at the back of her mind. Even at the back you know, of her mind. You know, mind. I mean, when something tragic happens yeah. to us, mm -hmm. we're always, you know, there's that fear. Yeah, that fear. That what if? Yeah, what, what if? if? Yeah. So, uh-huh. Yeah. And then came the rest of my siblings to the point that when she went to go tie her tube, she's like, I'm still pregnant. Like. When the Lord blesses you, he blesses you indeed. Come on. And that was the story. And so growing up, I've always seen my mom go from level to level, grace to grace, glory to glory, with the things of God. And I vividly remember one time she was laying on the floor, and she was crying out, and she was crying out concerning her marriage, because I always hear her pray, 
the Lord keep this marriage. You know, she's just, mm. she's always praying. Yeah. And then I hear her crying. So I get up and I tiptoe and I was no more than maybe eight, maybe yeah, around that age. Yeah. And I look mm. and I see her crying and she's crying out for my marriage and my womb. And she's like, Lord, let my child never suffer. Let my firstborn wow. never suffer. Let her open the doors. So even at a young so age. So like she was calling the first girl. Yeah, yeah. the first, because I'm the first girl. Yeah. I have my brother, then yeah. it's me. Right. And so she was crying out on my behalf. I'm sure she probably prayed for my brother, but the Lord woke me up at the specific time for me. And you heard. And I heard it. And I'm telling you, I was no more than eight to 10, but I vividly remember. And even the song that she was playing, I still remember. In the background. In the background. And she was on the floor. I won't ask you to sing it because you told me you can't sing to save your life. I can't save the same. Can't sing at all. And I, I don't need to save my life. So I won't take you there. <laughs> but it's a okay. cheese song. Right. And it said it says the Lord should speak. Erade mm. Kasa. That means Lord speak. Mm. Speak for my marriage. Speak right. for my children. Speak. And that was the song she was playing. And I believe that was a very pivotal moment in my life. I realized that, you know, you should be on your knees concerning things. Wow. And so growing up, you know, I always knew that my mom had struggled to give birth, but I will never struggle. So it was because not Because she even, prayed. Yeah, because she prayed. And I was, I'm so happy that I saw it at a young age because mm. it boosted my faith that nothing can happen. But look at God. Even directing you yeah. there at eight, eight. Yeah. To, to, hear that, to hear that and then to even get, get it stuck in yeah. your mind. Yeah. That that was something really good happening. Yeah. That's really mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. It yeah. can only be God. Talk about the Holy Ghost. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I think that really, really cemented in my mind. Right. And the Lord did that for a reason. And so growing up, you know, she would be funny and she would give me chicken gizzards. She would always cook like meat. And she would take the gizzards out and she's like, eat it and have a whole bunch of grandkids for me. So in my mind, I'm like, it's chicken gizzards supposed to promote babies or something. But I guess it worked. But the prayers must have worked. So fast forward, mm. you know, um, I'm in college now and I'm just living my best life in Christ. Okay, let me ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you. So you're 10, you're 8 to 10, yeah. and, and you're hearing mm -hmm. her praying mm -hmm. and all that. Now, you go to school, mm -hmm. you grow up, mm -hmm. like say, you become a teenager. Yeah. Did you have teenage problems? So, yes and no. I believe that it's the weirdest thing when I say it. But I, I was very aware and conscious that I was very special. It sounds weird to say but I was very conscious that there was a call of God on my life at a very, very young age. Mm. And all my life, nobody really said anything in terms of my aunts. They would always say, oh, you're so pretty, you're so cute. I was always a cute girl. But deep down inside, I knew that God had called me at a very, very, very young age. And they never pushed it on you? They never pushed it on me. But I preached my first sermon at the, ten, at the age of 10, like a full sermon. What do you mean and full it, sermon? <laughs> full Where? sermon. What? It was Sunday school, and the Sunday school kids took over the whole service. And they appointed me to preach. And I, I believe even my parents, my father too, was like, what did you preach? So I preached about the resurrection of Jesus, and people gave their lives to And you Christ. read the Bible? And I read the Bible. And I pre when I tell you, the Holy Ghost came upon me, and everyone was shocked. I was shocked. I was like, what is this? And you preached like preached? I preached, preached. I preached, preached. What? Yes. And I believe that was one of the, you know, my father passed away, but I believe that was one of the highlights of his life, because I remember him just watching me in, in the pews, and he's just like, wow. Mm -hmm. And then ever since then, he started coming more and more to church. He was a Catholic, and mm. then he would come to Methodist once in a while. But after that particular mm. preaching, mm. I remember he would come more and more and mm. more. So I believe that was a blessing within itself. Right. But in terms of teenage problems, I mean, like any teenager, I guess I went through a phase of, you know, um, I remember I've always had a shape. Yeah. A very distinct shape. <laughs> Sorry, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you don't want to call it, uh, you know, okay. 
the figure eight. Yeah. Had a figure eight. You know? Yeah. At a very young age. But I didn't realize that that's how my body looked. Yeah. Until one day, one of the little boys was like, Leslie got a big old feet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, so I never noticed that. Did you cry? No, okay. but I was confused. Because <laughs> I, I remember when a, a, a boy told the girl, you're so beautiful, yeah. the girl would cry. Why did you tell me? Because I have a cousin like that. If you tell her, yeah. when we were younger, you would tell her she's pretty, or she also has a big, she would stop crying. Yeah. <laughs> But I remember I was so confused because I was never really into boys like that. I've always been like, do your homework. I was a good kid for yeah. the most part. Right. You know, bit attitude. My mom would slap my lip a few times. Yeah. But for the most part, I've never drank till this day. Never had alcohol before. Never smoked a D in my life. But I've always had an attitude. I'm very snippy. So my mom would hit my lip. Yeah. But I remember this young boy saying, Leslie got a big old booty. <laughs> and then my name, my <laughs> before marriage name was Boateng. Yeah. And so they used to call me Booty Tang. So I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I was just, I used to be so confused. When he said it that day, I went to my house. Yeah. And I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, is it? Yeah. Is it? I didn't know this was you something. Know, something. Yeah. And so it made me aware, but because I was so aware, I began, I began to cover myself a lot. I I have, do you know, I have a daughter who's like that, yeah. exactly like that, mm -hmm. beautiful figure like you, yeah. and she always got intimidated because yeah. people noticed. Yeah. So even when you look at her, she always goes, <laughs> <laughs> what you looking at? <laughs> and she has the best shape, yeah. the most amazing figure, yeah. but she always covered. So you, you became conscious. I became so conscious. To the point that I believe that I began to get like obsessive over it. Like nobody look at me, don't come near me, don't touch me. Like just, I was just so. Yeah. And then one day my dad is like, oh, let me take you shopping. And then he took me shopping. And that time TLC was on yeah. and they used to have like really baggy jeans and the jumper. And so I, I bought a jumper and then I took it home. And then when I put it on, it was like really baggy. And I don't know if my father thought that I would end up liking girls or something. He was like, return it. Your pants need to be tighter than this. What is this? You're not a man. So he got scared. So I used to go through a lot of body issues because I'm like, why is my body so developed for a young lady? Yeah. And I never wanted to be like the object of anything sexual. Yeah. And so I was very like covered up all the time. But I believe that was God's way of keeping me. Maybe protecting you. It was. Yeah. Because otherwise, the kind of body that I had, men would have taken advantage of me. And then this gospel that I preached would have been tainted in a way. Right. You know. Right. And so I truly believe that God preserved me. So I was always in the corner background. I didn't want people to see me too much. Yeah. And then one day, I remember I got my menstrual for the first time. And I called my aunt. My, I called my mom, and my mom called my aunt who was downstairs, and she came up, and she was telling me, she was scaring me. She said, now that you got your menstrual, you're not allowed to sit on the floor. Women can't open their legs. You can't hug anybody. The minute you hug somebody, you're going to get pregnant. Pregnant. Immediately. <laughs> Hugging. Pregnant. Pregnancy. Yes. Don't hug. No. So it got to a point I would not hug anybody. I don't know why our parents used to do that. Like, what, like, so why don't you just tell somebody <laughs> It's not touching. My, my mother-in-law was touched by somebody mm -hmm. because the bus was very full. Mm -hmm. So they were squeezing and a man squeezed on her. She went and said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> she told the mother, I'm pregnant. What, what happened? A man, he was holding, you know, holding the bus and his body touched me. Because <laughs> the mama told her, yeah. the minute a man touches you, you're pregnant. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So that so was you, my story, basically. Yeah, so right. it got to a point, I'm like, don't come near me, don't yeah. touch me. So even now, my church members, they're probably like, why doesn't she like hugging? I'm like, <laughs> and now, you know, with my husband, he breathes on me and I get pregnant. Yeah. That's another day. <laughs> so right. I was very conscious of that kind of stuff. Right. Um, like I said, I've never gotten into cliques. I was never a cliquish type of girl. I didn't get into gangs. So peer pressure, no? No. Peer pressure, um, 
I'm very strong-willed, mm -hmm. very, very strong-willed. Yeah. If I don't want to do something, I will not do it. Mm -hmm. You can scream till that kingdom come and I still won't do it. And so I've, I've been confronted with situations where the people that I hung out with, I've seen them shoot people before dead. I, I've been around, you know, like real gangsters who would stab people up, who would smoke weed, who would do all these things. Wow. But I would just be in the background watching it. So you I've never touch it. Never touch it. Never even tried. But I've always been in those areas. Like I think the Lord allowed me to see a lot because all my friends were like really bad in high school. I'm talking about lesbians. I'm talking about they literally they would shoot up people because there was like a neighborhood war in the school that we were going to. And so silly me would just be with them. Yeah. <laughs> Let's like, do this. Let's do it. <laughs> And then I'll just not doing that. <laughs> right. So I had a lot of that. So I was exposed to a lot, but I never touched those things. To God be the glory. I mm -hmm. never really dealt with drugs. Never. I know what weed smells like. I've seen people smoke weed. I've seen people selling weed. But I never had a desire for it. Never in my life. Remember one time in college, and my friends and I were like, we can't be this good all our lives. Literally, how silly was that? Yeah. It was three of us. We're like, we cannot be this good. So I'm like, well, maybe we should like try to smoke or something. Yeah. And so we went to the store, and I'm like, sir, can you get me the <laughs> the stuff to roll? And he's like, what's the stuff called? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> get me the stuff. And he literally burst out in laughter like this. He's like, you're a joke. You don't want to smoke. You don't even know what it is. Right. And I'm like. Sir, we want to smoke. What is, what is your problem? So he's like, I don't have any of this stuff. So we went and stood outside our, our apartment. And then one of the church brothers magically passes by. And he's like, what are you guys doing outside? And I'm like, oh, we're trying to smoke. <laughs> I'm like, we're trying to. And he busts out and laughs. And he's like, Girl, you do not even know how to turn a lighter on, okay? So how can you be smoking? Yeah. But that was the one time I was trying to, but it never worked out. So you, so you really never went that direction? No, 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 I never went that direction in terms of even like, you know, having men in my dorm and stuff like that. That was not really me. Mm. That was not really but me But would they all. pursue you? Would oh, they all the time. Every day somebody was knocking on my door. Somebody's like, oh, and I was a resident assistant. So I had a big room to myself in college. And so you would always get a boy, oh, you want to watch a movie? No. <laughs> oh, do you want to go out to eat? No. So they used to call me a man eater. <laughs> <laughs> they would call me a man eater. Meaning? That I would just like tear men apart. Because I was so straight-faced. And so one of my friends who sees me now in marriage, in ministry, hugging and loving up on people, she always texts me. She's like, times have changed yeah. and people have changed. Because I was just so mean. Mm -hmm. I was very rude. That I was. Right. I was very rude. I will tell you off in a second. Don't look at me. Don't yeah. come near me. Leave me alone. Yeah. Like, I was just that girl. Yeah. Just leave me alone. Leave me alone. But I would wear my little tight clothes in college, though. I would wear my tight clothes in the club. And so one day, they put me on a flyer, and my mom found out. And she was like, how dare you? How dare you? Take, tell them to take you off of that flyer right now. You're not a video vixen. Why are you on a flyer? So I've had, you know, different types of stories. Like right. That, you know. But you never really work. That's really no, amazing. No. And, and you know, that ministers to a young girl who's watching us right now to know that it is possible actually oh. to, to even be around, yes. you know, people who are rioters mm -hmm. and doing all manner of things and not do. Yeah, I believe that is one of the stories that I carry um, because there's always this thing where if you haven't been through nothing, then you have no story to tell. But I've actually been through so much and I've seen it, but God's hand was so much on me that even you. if I wanted to do it, he wouldn't allow me to do right. it. I remember one day in our neighborhood, me and my cousin were standing there, and one of the neighborhood boys came, and he said, the police are coming, and you know how they act when black boys are just standing there. Yeah. So he took out his gun, and he said, hold the gun for me. When they drive past, I'll come and get it. I was 
Fuck. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not about to get me <laughs> framed in trouble. Yeah. None of that. He begged and begged and begged. I said, nope, we're not touching that. You better run away. Find something else. And so I've always been in the vicinity of a lot of nonsense. But God has preserved me. Always preserved him. Wow. So fast forward now. You've grown up. I wanted to really hear, like, if you went through any challenges mm -hmm. as, a, as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really good. So now fast forward, you've grown up. You're now trying to get married. Were mm -hmm. you trying to get married? Did you go looking for apostle? What <laughs> happened there? <laughs> so when it comes to marriage, um, I was not really thinking about it because the thought of mind is when you get to like 30 is when you have to panic. So I was still like 21, 20, living my best life. And I met Apostle when I was 10 years old. He was my brother's friend. They used to play basketball and football together. So one day they had finished playing and they came to the house to get some water. And I was folding clothes and he saw me and I saw him. I was only 10 years old, but there's only so much you can do. And I don't think I really felt nothing, but I remember he was highlighted to me out of all his friends. And apparently I was highlighted to him that day too. So he always remembers the day I was folding clothes and I was only 10. And, um, and he was how old? He was about 17. Yeah, around 16, 17, the most around that time. Right. But that was the first encounter that I had with him. Um, and so I've always seen him around. It was nothing serious. And then one day he disappeared because he went to college. And then we went to a family gathering at this huge hall, and there were so many people there. And I remember he came up to me. He's like, oh, wow, you grew up. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I grew up. <laughs> I grew up to be a fine young lady. Yeah. So I can tell he wanted to talk to me. But again, I wasn't too interested because I've just been, I want to go to medical school. I, I want to just mind my business. That's my whole life, mind my business and keep it moving. Right. And so um, I went to him and we were talking and he's like, oh, do you have a Facebook or something? And at that time, Facebook, you only can use your college account. But I didn't, ha I wasn't in college at the time, but I didn't want him to know I was so young. Mm. Otherwise he wouldn't be interested. Right. But I'm like, oh, because I don't want to give. Because you felt like uh, he was a good guy? Yeah, when I saw him, I thought he grew up too. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, you grew up yeah. too. Like, whoa, okay. Like, whoa. Yeah. So, you know, I was trying to bluff him a bit because I didn't want him to know how young I was. So I'm like, no, you don't need to know my Facebook. So for like an hour, we're talking. And he's like, I really want to know your Facebook. I really want to interact with you. And I'm like, no. Finally, we separate. And then I finally get into college, I think the following year. And the first person who invites me as a friend on Facebook <laughs> is him. So I'm like, have you been waiting all this time yeah. to invite me? And he's like, well, maybe, maybe not. So we started talking more. And the more we would talk, we got to know each other. And one day he's like, you know, he used to play basketball. He was really good. He was going into the leagues and everything. And he calls me. He's like, pray for me so I can mm -hmm. win. So I prayed and he won. So ever since then, every day he would be like, pray for me. And then he would win. The days that I did not pray for him, he would lose the game. The whole game would be lost. Wow. So it was then he realized that, that I was. He, he needs you. Yeah. Pretty in his much, life. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> so he would tell you to pray. He would tell me to pray and I would pray for him. I would, you know, all these things. Mm. And um, we would do that on and off, on and off. And then we would stop talking sometimes because he was in college doing his own thing. And then I was in college at that time. And, you know, I would talk to certain boys, but I would realize, like, eh, there's no connection. You're not interested. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, him being a basketball player, tall, dark, and handsome, the girls were all over him. Yeah. So he was in his college. And so it was on and off, on and off. But for some reason, we would always sense each other. It's the mm, weirdest thing. That's we would, amazing. Yeah, we would sense each other. Yeah. And so there were times where I would be driving back home from Buffalo, which is about eight hours to New York, sometimes even 10 hours driving. So we would be driving. And then as soon as I hit, like, New Jersey area, he would call me. And he's like, Ohema, which means queen in our language. He's like, Is Ohema. that your name? No, but that's what he calls me because I'm his queen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So he would call you queen from then? Yeah, he would call me queen. He would say, Ahima, how are you? I miss you. And I'm like, do you have a monitoring spirit or something? Like, why do you know I'm here? It happened about six times. Every time me and my friends were driving back and I hadn't heard from him in like months and months, he would magically call. So I used to tell him like, do you have a tracker on me or something? Why do you know <laughs> right. when I'm here? So one day we met up, we went to the movie theaters and I had on this black cat suit and I'm like, oh, he better touch up on me. He better, you know, <laughs> and I put on a long jacket. We go to the movie theaters and he's a perfect gentleman. He didn't try to touch me. He didn't try to kiss me. He didn't put his arms around me. And you were ready. <laughs> You're like, he better touch. I'm like, something better happen. Like, I'm ready to risk yeah. it all right now. I've been good all my life. I I'm might as well. So I'm then, just, when you, then when you're ready, he, he's playing Mr. Man. Yeah. He literally sat there and watched the movie like this. And I'm like, is this, is this like serious? So something happened in the movie theaters, and they actually had to kick us all out to stand outside so they can fix, I don't know if something broke or water main pipe or something. Right. So we stand outside, and then I have the jacket, and I open the jacket, I have my little cat suit on, and yeah. I'm like... Yeah, like... <laughs> and he's legit looking in the air like, yeah, the movie's pretty good. <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of man is this? So wow. we finished the movie, he didn't touch me, didn't try to kiss me, didn't do nothing. We sat in the car and we're driving back home and I'm just like, and whatever. he's talking and he's like, I really like you. And I'm like, whatever, <laughs> I don't have time for you. Don't, how do you show it? You, yeah. don't even, you don't even know how to show it. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever. Yeah. So we get to my, the front of my house and he's like, you know, I really had a great time with you. I'm like, yeah, 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 <laughs> it's okay. And then he magically says, you know, I would love to take you somewhere tonight. So I'm like, where? Where do you want to take me? Yeah. And he's like, well, I'm going to prayer meeting. Do you want to go? <laughs> and I'm like, you're going to a prayer meeting? Yeah. And you want me to go? He's like, yeah, I want you to go. And I'm like, bye. I have to go. <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> so God has literally preserved. Protected you. It's because it's like you are ready. Now let's do this. Let's <laughs> I was ready to risk it all. And the way I'm fertile, I would have probably had six kids by then. But the Lord literally was protecting wow. me. Wow, right. The whole time. Did you like him more after that? You know, I was indifferent. Because there was another circumstance where he called me, and that time I had like, I didn't even have menstrual cramps, but I told him that I had menstrual cramps, just to see like his yeah. reaction. And he goes, lay your hand on your belly and let me cast out that demon. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm expecting you to tell me you love me or it's going to be okay. You yeah. wish you were there to rub my belly. <laughs> He's like, lay your hand on your belly. Let me cast that demon out. <laughs> you're, like, you're, you're being too spiritual for me right now. <laughs> too much. So after then, I was over it. I'm like, this guy is too spiritual. Like, yeah. It, it just too Forget much. this. Forget it. Yeah. So we would talk on and off, on and off. Then finally, I was getting ready to go to medical school. I got accepted to medical school. And then he goes, he calls me one day, and he's like, I really want to ask for your hand in marriage. I'm like, no. I'm just like that. Just like that. I'm like, no, I'm going to medical school. This cannot happen. So I just shut it down. And then... Around that time, we met again. We called. He called Did you me. mean it, though? At that time, I was confused because I had just entered college. And I'm like, I'm going to medical school. I really don't even know my left from my right. But he was finishing college. So he was in that space of, I want to start a ministry. You know, he's, he, he's he did. He knew his, he was starting a ministry. Yeah, he knew that God had called him as well, too. Mm. Yeah. And so... You know, there was even one time way before where we tried to meet up and I tried to bring him. If my mom is watching, hey, mom, yeah. <laughs> I tried to bring him to my house. But the Holy Spirit, literally, my mom and my dad were going all the way to Connecticut for a funeral. And we lived in Brooklyn and that's a long distance. And they were going to a funeral. And so I told him, as soon as they leave, you can come. We can spend time in the house, you know. Whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Like, I, I felt like I was so good, I was ready to just risk it all. <laughs> so again, I tell him, and he's like, okay, yeah. cool. 
So he's coming from the Bronx, which is like an hour away. So he gets halfway there and he begins to call me. But for some reason, and now I know it's the Holy Spirit, said, don't pick up. Don't pick up the call. So I'm like, why shouldn't I pick up the call? So he, he's calling, calling, called me about 30 times and I did not pick up. Come to find out within about 10 minutes, my parents turned back around and they said that they were not going to the funeral anymore. So had they come and they saw a man in the house, my head would have been chopped off and this interview would not be going. <laughs> you would have died that day. That seemed, and they would have told God that I died. <laughs> they would have killed me. <laughs> they would have right. killed me. Right. And so the Lord just literally kept on preserving my stupidity. Every mm -hmm. time I wanted to do something, yeah. stupid, he just would not allow me to do it. So it's God. So what you're saying even to a young girl mm -hmm. is that it's God who keeps us. It it's not God. by our own might and power. And what I also encourage is the prayers of the saints really do matter mm. because my mom had started praying for me to be preserved at a very, very young age. And so when it came to rape, as, as voluptuous as I was, no man has ever tried to touch me inappropriately or do anything of that sort, you know? And I really believe that it was my mom's prayers that were guarding me, and my father was very present in my life. And so everyone knew that I didn't have a low self-esteem, like, if you try me, I'll go tell my dad, and my dad will come and beat you up yeah. for me. Yeah. So I think those things God put in place to really help me. And I always tell mothers, you can send prayers ahead of time, my mom has sent so many prayers ahead of time, specifically for me, mm. that even the Lord has shown me. And so wow. the Lord literally preserved me. Mm. And so even when I began to preach online and stuff, my spiritual father, he would look at me and he said, you know the only reason why you can preach so loud with that big mouth of yours yeah. is because you don't have any dirt attached to your name. Because if you would have went and slept around with a lot of people, it would have took a lot. It would have stifled your voice, mm. even if the Lord would have lifted you up. Mm. You yourself would have had so many convictions. There would have been so much going on. Right. And so the Lord literally preserved my voice. He's like, I'm not going to allow anything to stifle it. Right. And so right now when I preach, I don't have to worry about this man. Who's going to say me. what? Yeah, who's who's do gonna, what? Yeah. yeah, everyone has yeah. their own story. There are people's stories where... You know, that's the path that they went and the Lord lifted them up. The raps are still there. The yeah. <laughs> They're still there. And the and, Marys. Yeah, and the Marys. <laughs> and, and the so, Magdalene. And the Magdalene. Yeah, you know. There's all types of stories. And yeah. my story is really a story of preservation, like the preservation power of God. You know, I always say I've had friendship issues mm. a lot. That Like, I've always had people extremely hate me, like friends would get really jealous of me. I, I used to fight. I'm a fighter. Like, I use my hands a lot. I yeah. would fight you. Like, for real? For real. Like, real? Physical? Like, physical fight. <laughs> I fought a boy once and shook the whole class. What? I'm a fighter. Knock somebody out. Yeah? <laughs> I'm a fighter. Wow. Yeah, as sweet as I look, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. You sting like a bee. I sting like a bee. <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. So... You've now been preserved, so you're not, you know, doing mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. God tells you not to pick up the call. Yes. Do you pick it up after a while? Do you so get after to a while, I went back to school, and then he called me. And he's like, you stood me up. Why didn't you call me? And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So we just continued talking, and years went by. And we began to pray together a lot because I was ministering at that time in college in my church. And then he was also ministering. So when we would call each other, we would pray, literally pray. It wouldn't even be casual conversations. It would right. just be really prayer. And it wasn't even like lovey-dovey prayers about marriage. It was spiritual. It was highly spiritual. So, you, <laughs> so, so now, you all started on a spiritual note. Too much. Not physical. No, too much. It was too much spiritual. Too much. <laughs> too much. So I always tell, you know, wow. the, the church members, like, have balance. Because I realized we didn't have balance. It was mm. to the point that one day we were praying. And prophetically, I began to minister to him about his wife. And, you know, in Ghana, my name is Akusia. Yeah. But I was named after Akusia my... Akusia means what? I was born on a Sunday. Uh. But I was named after my father's mother, who is born on a Thursday. So it's Yah. So all my life, everyone has known me as Yah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was ministering to him, I'm like, your wife's name is going to be Akusia, and she's going to be a healer. She, she operates in the prophetic, not realizing I'm talking about myself because I consider myself yeah. Right. So, so I'm talking Akusia, this and that. So he's like, are you seriously telling me that you might not be my wife? I'm like, nope. But it's good that you know who your wife is now. So when you find her, her name is Akosia. Yeah. It's a prophet. You know, go for it. So I remember he hung up the phone like, okay, I'll call you. And I can tell he was a little annoyed. Like, why would I say that? But that's what the Lord has shown me. Right. <laughs> that Not her, knowing that it's you. Not realizing that it was me. So some time goes by. And he's like, I want us to go on a 21-day fast and pray concerning this if it's the will of God, and then I'll leave you alone if it's not the will of God. Mm. We go on the 21-day fast. I tell him, you don't call me, I don't call you. So if you're fasting in regards to a man, leave it alone. Let God. Let God do it. Because the minute he gets intertwined and he's calling you to check up on you, your emotions go ahead of the Holy Spirit. In fact, now that we're at this, I tell young ladies mm -hmm. that the minute you sleep with somebody, mm -hmm. you, you focus changes you don't see what you need to see mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. so much you need to see mm -hmm. but it's blocked mm -hmm. because now you've entangled mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you start you start to see mm -hmm. you know just one sided one side and you don't see other yeah. very major mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that you need to see yeah love right. is blind but marriage isn't it's an eye opener it's an eye opener right and so you know i told him don't call me i won't call you so we didn't speak to each other for 21 days. And I was really fasting and praying because I'm like, he keeps coming around for some reason. I want to know. But I did, hadn't heard from God. 21 days, he called me back like I heard from God. But I never picked up. And so day 21, maybe up until day 40, he's calling every day, calling every day. And I'm not picking up my phone. And I'm off of Facebook. And I'm just like, I've muted the whole world out because that's how I am. If I want to hear from God, I'm like, I got to tune everything out. Wow. So he's calling, calling, calling. Didn't pick up about day 40. And I even blocked him. So any messages he was sending, I never got. And apparently. He deliberately did that. Yes. Because that's how much it's like we were. My spirit was gelling too much with him. And I needed a confirmation from God. I did not want to go ahead of God mm. at all. And so, you know, about day 40 came. I didn't. And then. Maybe day 50, 40 to 50, I was like, okay, I heard from God. And then I tried to call him, and he didn't pick up. And I'm like, he's not picking up. It does not pay to bluff a man at all, because they will move on. Yeah. So he moved on extremely fast. So one day I'm sitting there. I forgot about him. Maybe two months went by. And my friend messages me, and she's like, oh, I see Dominic at this um, family gathering, and he's with a girl. And I was like, it is what it is. I don't care, whatever. Some few months pass by, and another girl sends me a YouTube link. And she's like, watch this. And then I hear the young lady. She's like, hi, I just want to thank my fiancé for helping me. And I'm like, oh. and she's like, my fiancé, Dominic. And I was like, oh. yeah, just he like was. that. He was. He <laughs> was. So I thought that was Did you it. feel bad? Oh, I did. I did. And you know one thing bad I... Bad or jealous? Both mixed. Mixed. Together. Mixed. Together. <laughs> okay. I was like, how dare he? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and he's fine. Mm. So I was like, damn. I hope I don't get I missed like, on a good. Yeah. <laughs> was I proud? Were, yeah. you, were you thinking maybe yeah. I was too maybe I was too proud? Yeah. Maybe I should have picked up. Yeah. Why yeah. did I block him? Why did I block him? <laughs> Why did I block him? Yeah. So it was a lot of um, you know, I was upset. But I remember in that moment I was sitting on my bed. And I had called my roommate in. And she's like, oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know how I feel right now. So she goes and she grabs me a tub of ice cream. And she's like, sit, let's eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but immediately, the Holy Spirit tells me, no. No. You cannot go into a pit over a man. And that's why I always tell people that we have the ability wow. to stop the enemy in his tracks. Wow. Because if I would have went down that roller coaster, so I always tell people I don't know how what it feels like to be heartbroken because I've never gotten there. I took myself out immediately. I said, well, this is God's will. 
and I removed myself. And if you took that direction, you, you would definitely have been heartbroken, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, crying. but you refused. I refused it. Within, within two minutes, I will never forget, she brought me a Briar's ice cream, a big thing, and she said, here, let's sit and eat it. And I looked at her and I was like, no, this is not what God has called me for. No, and that's why I say I'm very wow. strong-willed. Yeah. If I'm determined, I'm very like, no, God is not for me. It's it is. not in this, so I'm not doing it. No. So you didn't. I didn't. But uh, that always reminds me that you have the ability to go up or down. You have you the choose power. Joy. You yeah. have the power. You, have, you choose. You joy. have the power to choose. Yeah. Yeah. So you chose. I'm not going down down that direction. Yeah. And you okay. So. so if, Fast forward, mm -hmm. what became of that relationship? So fast forward, my dad dies May 2013. I hadn't spoken to him for about two years, maybe even three years. 2013, my dad dies. As they're wrapping him up, I begin to say in my spirit, I need a hug from Dominic. Like, I couldn't cry because I felt like I'm, I have to take care of my siblings. And my mom was there. It was just everyone else was crying, and I'm trying to be the watchdog. But in my spirit, I'm like, I just need a hug from Dominic. Then I rebuked myself, and I'm like, that's a married man. Like, I started rebuking myself in the hospital room. Mm. Like, I rebuke this. I rebuke mm. this. Not knowing that that was around the time that things got a little shaky between him and the girl. So fast forward, my dad dies May. December of 2013, I'm praying on the floor literally crying out to God, like there has to be more to this life than just school, work, work, school. <laughs> like I need more out yeah. of this. So I'm crying on the floor, crying out. And he says, pray for Dominic. So I'm like, no. So I the start Holy saying, Spirit. the Holy Spirit says, pray for Dominic. I'm like, no. I literally got up out of my tears and I was like, no, I'm not praying for him. So for about 10 minutes, I was literally talking to myself like, no, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to pray for this guy. So then I call my friend. The beauty of having anointed friends. Come on. Come on. She now tells me, listen to the Lord. He's not telling you to pray for him to be your husband. Yeah. But he's saying pray. So obey the Lord right. because he's probably doing it for you and this is a test of your obedience. So when I looked at it from that standpoint, I was like, okay, I'm just being obedient. So I started writing stuff down. I still have the notebook. He said, pray for Dominic's head, pray for his blood, pray for his mind, pray for his job, pray for his body. So I would just, as I'm led, I would just yeah. pray, 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 pray. Not knowing that while I was praying and I had not heard from him in years, he was also in Ghana and he was on a mountain and he was praying and crying out to God concerning the relationship he was in. Whoa. Yes. So he went with the girl and a series of things happened and it was confirmation that, you know, she was not the one. Mm. So she left the mountain earlier than him and she came back to America. Before he left, he stayed a couple more days and before he left, he had two prophetic words that the Lord is bringing his wife, the angel of the Lord is bringing his wife. And then when he got to the airport, someone else told him that the person you're with, when you go, she'll leave. When she leaves, don't try to go back because he's a very loyal person. Mm. And he would have worked it out. He would have tried his best, but that wasn't God's will. And that's how the enemy got him with like a demonic compassion because mm. that's how he is. He's very, you know, caring loving. and loving. Right. And so if you're not careful, he'll stick with the bad situation, you know. And so the Lord had to warn him in Ghana at an airport. When he comes February 1st of 2014 now, right. the young lady packs up and she said, this is not my lifestyle. Uh -uh. You're praying too <laughs> much. You're too deep. Ain't nobody got time. No. <laughs> so she literally packs up and leaves. And wow. he never tried to go back to pursue her ever. And so in that time, now I'm in Buffalo. I had prayed those prayers in December. It's now February. I'm minding my business. Uh, my friend comes to do her hair. She had just moved to Buffalo. She was doing her pharmacy. And she, every, everyone knows I used to do hair. So she's like, I heard you used to do hair. Can you do my hair? So she comes to my house one evening. And she's like, um, it was around February-ish. And that December when I was praying, the Lord told me that um, Valentine's Day, 
would be the last Valentine's Day that I spent alone of 2013. Because my friends used to kind of mock me, like, you're the only one without a boyfriend. You're this, you're that. We had a group chat, and they asked one time, um, what do we buy for a man? And one said, she's going to buy shoes. And I said, don't buy a man shoes that's not your husband. He'll walk out of your life. <laughs> it's just something that I heard, so I just started to say it. Right. So they're like, oh, please, you've never been in a relationship. You, don't you know wouldn't what know. You would not know. Yeah. I went home. Go read your Bible. Yeah, I went home and I cried out to God. God said that would be your last Valentine's Day together um, by yourself. Alone. alone. December, I pray for him. February, the girl leaves. February, the friend comes to my house to braid her hair. So as she's getting her hair braided, she's like, girl, we got to marry right. We can't be marrying wrong because our generation is just doing too much wrong marriages, especially when you know you have the call of God on your life. And she's mm -hmm. a prophet of the Lord as well, too. And so she's just talking, and she's like, one of my good friends, you know, he was in a situation. Uh, thank God he's out of it now, and we're praying concerning some stuff. So I'm like, okay, she didn't mention any names. Mm. So I'm just doing her hair. Finished doing her hair. I lay on the couch because I was so tired. I had school, work, and then I came to do hair. Mm. So I'm laying on the couch. I'm going on Facebook, and then I see that though I have blocked him on Facebook, I can still see that she had tagged him. I just couldn't click on his name. So I'm like, how do you know this guy? Like, what is this? Yeah. And she's like, that's the guy I've been talking to you about the whole time. And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and she's like, he's no longer married. Like, the girl, it didn't work out. They didn't even get to have a real wedding. Like, it did not work out. So I'm like, what do you I mean? You're not interested. Like, talk to me. Talk to me. Yeah. So I'm like, what do you mean this didn't happen? And she's like, yeah, it was not the will of God. And, and she goes, look how skinny I look. We've been fasting and praying. So I'm like, really? So she shows me a picture of him, and he had gotten so skinny because he had just come from the mountain. Now he's going through, like, a divorce, and he's fasting and praying. So I'm like, ooh, why does he look like that? Why is he so skinny? Yeah. And she's like, because he's on a dry fast, and we me and a few other guys were supporting him because he says that the angel of the Lord is bringing his wife. So I'm like, okay. So I'm like, do you know the name of the person you're wife. fasting for? So she's like, yeah. And again, everyone calls me Yah because that's my tree name. So he's like, so she's like, oh, I think his, her name is Yah. And I was like, do you know her American name? And she's like, no, but what do you care about? And I was like, okay. So five minutes went by, and I'm like, could you do me a favor? Could you call that guy and ask him who you guys are fasting for? So without any resistance, she actually calls. She calls. I hear his voice. And immediately, it's like Elizabeth. Something just leaped, but it had to be calm. And she's like, what's the name of the person we're fasting for? You only told us her African name, but what's her English name? And he's like, hmm, you in Buffalo? And she's like, yeah. And he was like, well, she's in Buffalo. So she's like, oh. and then he goes, her name is Leslie. She freaks out. She starts screaming, like literally screaming, jumping up. My roommate comes out like, what? And I'm like. And he's still on the phone? No, she had hung up. Yeah. And she literally hung up on him. She's like, I'll call you back. <laughs> so she's screaming, jumping, and she's like, you are the girl I've been fasting and praying for all this time. And I'm like. Yeah, and she's like, we have done like eight days dry, no food for you. And I didn't even know it was you. Leave me.